Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, we pray that this uh, message will be a blessing to you and uh, also take opportunity to spread the Word by sharing it with other people that you know may benefit from what's said tonight. And so we want to get out that Word to as many people as possible. So uh, tonight uh, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. So I'll give you an opportunity to get your Bible and, and turn there. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. We'll look at verse 6. It says, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Jesus Christ, constantly nourished on the words of faith and on the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women, on the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I guess if I were to title this, I would title it Getting in Good Spiritual Shape. You know, we hear a lot these days about our uh, physical health and being in the best shape we can and making sure our immune systems are as strong as they can. And, and that's important. You know, we need to take care of our, our bodies. This particular passage, Paul takes advantage of the symbolism of physical and spiritual health. And, uh, but he emphasizes more the importance of our being in good spiritual shape and the spiritual exercises and the spiritual disciplines that we all need to keep and, and, and be able to do in order to be strong physically. Uh, as we look at this, we'll see that it's, it's basically written to uh, ministers, uh, pastors, but it's so applicable to all of us. You know, he's telling pastors how to, how to do these things for their flock, but it's also a word to us as believers, as, as the flock, to what to do to have that good spiritual health in our life. And, of course, if you look at it, it, it boils down to eating right and exercise. Uh, that's what experts, physicians tell us that we need to do to be in good spiritual and in in good physical health is to eat right and exercise. And we'll see those two aspects in this passage. First of all, the eating right, it, he he speaks there about being constantly nourished on the word of faith and to avoid these worldly fables. So he's saying intake God's word and don't intake the bad stuff for your body. But don't eat on the false fables, the, the false mentalities, those things that are falsely being taught by the world, sometimes being falsely taught by those who claim to be teaching the word. We've got to avoid those things, but make sure that we're intaking and nourishing on the word of faith, God's word. And, and that's so cru crucial. We, we tell people all the time about how important it is not just to hear the word on Sunday or just on Wednesday, but to take in that word all the time, every day. Have your daily nutrition of God's word. You wouldn't want to just eat one time a week on Sunday, would you? Um, I know I don't. Um, I want to have my nutrition at least three times a day. And so we need to be able to intake part of God's word each day for that nutrition that's, that's so well. And then to avoid all that negative things that can come in. You know, because the world and, and all of its attack is contrary to the word of God. And we, can, we take too much of that in. Uh, we can become uh, very swayed toward that mentality and say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound too bad, but we always judge it based on the Word of God. The Word of the Lord is the plumb line. You know, when carpenters build something, they set a plumb line to make sure it's not just where they look that it's straight, but it's straight based on the plumb line. And God's Word is the plumb line. We've got to eat right by taking in God's Word, because God's Word contains all those things that we need. It's, it's kind of like a, the signs on a, on a trip. You take a road trip, you're going to see two kinds of signs, 
mainly. One's going to be telling you where your destination's going to be. It says there on the, on the road you're headed, Dallas, 152 miles. Then if you stay on that road, you're going to be in Dallas. And so the Word of God tells us if we stay on these particular roads that it talks about, you're going to end up at a particular destination. And how important that is. They say, how did I get here? Well, you got here, we got here by going down a particular path. And the Word of the Lord shows us uh, how our choices uh, that aren't made according to God's Word can lead us, obviously, to some negative destinations. The uh, other signs on a road trip have to do with uh, warnings. You know, bridge out, detour, uh, road close. You know, they tell us some warnings ahead of time so that we can avoid many of the negative things on that road trip. God's Word gives us those as well, those warnings that help us in our travel, in our life, as we're headed to the destination that we want to be on, and God will bless us that way. So we've got to take in that spiritual nutrition. Also, not only eating right, but here's that word we none of us usually like to hear, and that's exercise, discipline. He talks about two kind of disciplines, spiritual discipline and bodily discipline. And he, he doesn't say that body, bodily discipline is bad. He says it's of little profit. And I believe he, he's not saying don't do it. Obviously, we need to exercise. It is important, but he's comparing it to that spiritual exercise. Compared to it, it's little. Why? Well, first of all, no matter how well we exercise on this side, uh, it's still once we die, we're, that bodily exercise is only going to profit us till death. But our spiritual exercise, as he mentions here, clearly he talks about it being profitable and a promise for this present life and also for the life to come. It brings so many benefits to our life and how we live our life now and how we exercise ourselves. You know, you say, but Pastor Tim, I thought we're saved by grace. And we are. And we walk by grace. We're always dependent on God for everything. But that doesn't negate that we need to have spiritual disciplines in our life and, and, and exercise and, and do things in our life that, that, that require that for our own spiritual well-being. So it doesn't negate grace, but it, does, it doesn't negate our responsibility also as well to, to grow. And this is what's required because he talks about it for the purpose. There's a purpose in that spiritual exercise, that spiritual discipline, and that's godliness where we put Christ, we put God in its, his proper priority and, and a proper attitude and focus and direction on God and being, being more Christ-like and all those things that we strive for in our Christian maturity. You know, this word for, that's listed here for discipline, in the Greek, it's the word gymnazo. And gymnazo is where we get our English word gymnasium or gymnastics. It has to do with to train or to exercise is what it means uh, in, in that Greek language, to train and exercise. See, that's our responsibility to, to be strong spiritually here as we, as we do these spiritual disciplines. You know, and it, it's easy to be lazy. That's the easy thing to do. You know, the hard things to do is to do those spiritual exercises. You know, it's said one time of an Amish family that had never been off the farm, and they got a ride to the city, and not only got a ride to the city, they got a ride to the mall in the city, and they'd never been. They'd never seen stores like that. They'd never seen all those people, and they, they were just amazed. And, and the dad walked up to this device. He had no idea what it was. It was silver and shiny with numbers on top. He, he didn't know what an elevator was, and he saw this device, that would open up by itself and close by itself and numbers would light up at the top. He just sat there in amazement. He finally noticed this elderly woman just in a cane and uh, she kind of made her way onto that elevator and he noticed the lights went, you know, one, two, three, and then three, two, one. And after a while, the door opened back up and here's this young uh, lady and, and Perfect health, not bent over, no cane, uh, very attractive, uh, just made her way off the elevator. And the dad looked over at the son and said, son, go get your mom. You see, 
if only our spiritual growth happened that fast. It would be a walking in a door one way and walking back out of the door and we're, we're godly, we're, we're changed forevermore. It's, it's, there is a process in our walk and it requires discipline. It, it won't just happen overnight. And so a lot of people wonder why they're not growing in Christ, but maybe they haven't exercised the spiritual disciplines that God wants them to do. Listen to what Donald Whitney wrote in his book, Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. I don't like to read a lot just directly when I do these messages, but this little small portion in his book, I think, is classic. He writes, Godly people are disciplined people. It has always been so. Call to mind some of the heroes of church history. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Bunyan, Susanna Wesley, George Whitfield, Lady Huntington, Jonathan and Sarah Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, George Mueller. They were all disciplined people. In my own pastoral and personal Christian experience, I can't say I've ever known a man or a woman who came to spiritual maturity except through discipline. Godliness comes through discipline. You know, what a great statement that it's just required. It's part of what we have to do in order to be where God wants us to be in our walk. I thought of a couple of things that I think are, are crucial here that in a disciplined life that, that we've got to do. First of all, we've got to count the cost. You know, isn't that what uh, Jesus said in Luke 14, 28, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he have, has enough to complete? When you're going to build a home, we're going to build a project, you've got to look and say, okay, how long is this going to take? How much is it going to take? Of course, it usually takes a little bit more time and a little bit more money, but you've got a general idea and say, okay, are we going to, do we have that kind of money, that kind of budget, and that, or that kind of time to get this project complete? And then when you say yes, then you do because you're willing to count the cost. Well, there's a cost involved that you're, it's going to take some time and effort and energy for you to do these spiritual disciplines. You know, I like to watch the Olympics sometime. My favorite part's watching them get those medals, you know, with the music behind and all of that, representing their country and getting that gold medal. You know, you, you may like I, you know, you picture say, man, just think if that was me getting that medal, how that must feel to, to do that. Well, I'm never gonna get one of those medals. One takes a lot of talent, but beside that, it takes a lot of discipline. Those people, they train immensely day after day, morning to night. and They don't do a lot of things that, uh, you know, they're probably asked by friends, hey, let's go to the movie and let's go out to eat. And, you know, I'm sure they deny a lot of that. You know, the Bible says, deny thyself, take up the cross and follow me. You know, that there's denial of self that's involved in that Olympian being all they can be. They exercise, they train, they discipline. They've counted the cost. And so, um, yes, I'd like the reward of it, but I'm not doing the discipline of it. And a lot of people are like that in their Christian walk. They want the rewards, which is the godliness and all those other blessings that come from being more like Christ, but it requires the discipline and the exercise that many of us don't want. So to have the benefit, we've got to do it the same way with college. You know, people go to college, count the cost, but they've looked down the road and said, I think it's worth the benefit for what lies ahead. And that's what we've got to do in our particular walk in life as well. You know, it also requires that we want to please God more than others. You know, it's going to take being uh, maybe not what everybody else wants us to be when we do these spiritual exercises. You know, in John 12, 43, it says for, talking about the Pharisees, they wouldn't come to Christ. They were too afraid what other people thought. And it said, Jesus said, for they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. They'd rather have men be pleased with them than God. You know, that's where we've got to look. You know, some people may not understand our spiritual disciplines and convictions and the things that we're striving to be, but God's the one that we seek to approve and to please, and we've got to get past that. You know, these Olympians, you know, they say, hey, my family, I'm not being with them as much, I'm not being with doing this as much, and, and, but hey, they've got a goal in mind, and we do as well. 
You know, the third thing that we got to look at too when we want this discipline exercise life is it'll require consistency. You know, that's usually what happens. We get in the maybe the exercise mode in January. <laughs> uh, that's why by February or March you may see, a, or by April, you'll see a lot of exercise equipment at the garage sales because by that time the consistency's worn off. We're not doing it faithfully like the commitment that we made maybe on January 1st. But there has to be that consistency. I often thought of, I think about Daniel. When the decree went out that you couldn't pray to anybody but the king, you know, no other God, no, nobody but to the king. And Daniel was a godly, out, outstanding uh, man of God. And, and he, you know, he could have had some choices. You know, he may have said, and this was a decree for 30 days. You know, he could have said, well, I'm just going to hold off praying altogether for 30 days. He could have said, well, I'm going to pray with my window closed so nobody could see me praying to, to my God, which was the true God. He could have said, well, I'll just pray to the king for 30 days and God will understand and I'll go back to praying to God, which he knew that wouldn't have been right. Or he could have done what he did. He prayed to God and God only and the decree wasn't going to keep him from praying and what was amazing when he said, when he did what, you know, he knew praying to other gods was wrong. He knew praying to the king was wrong, but he kept his conviction. And what's amazing, the point I want to bring out was in Daniel 6.10, it talked about, it says, praying and giving thanks to God before his God as he had been doing previously. So he was just exercising spiritually. He had always been praying during those times. And even when the king threw him in the lion's den, listen to what a pagan king even said. Your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. He even saw the testimony of his consistency. He was consistent in his walk. And that's how we ought to be in our spiritual exercise. We've got to be consistent in our walk with the Lord. You know, I've heard, I know you've heard this before I've said it before and uh, other pastors have shared it. I thought it's so essential to put it here. It was the story of Eric Liddell, uh, who, you know, trained to be an athlete. He was a runner. He was from England. He went to the Olympics in Paris and in 1924 to compete in the 100-yard uh, race, 100-meter, excuse me, uh, dash. And, and he was training as a short-distance runner. And when he got over there, they told him when his race was, and that race was on a Sunday. And he, he had so much discipline, he had so much conviction, he said, no, I can't run that race on the Lord's day. And man, everybody was, you know, the fans, the sports writers, they just couldn't understand why he would do that, to train so long, to represent his country and then to do that. But he did. And he said, no, I'm not. But the 400 meter was not on Sunday. He had never trained for that. And he ran that race. He not only won it, but he, he broke a world record. And even a movie was about him called Chariots of Fire. He got the benefits of being disciplined to hold to his convictions that for him that he knew was right. You see, there's benefits. That godliness is a benefit for all of us when we use these spiritual uh, disciplines, when we uh, eat upon God's word, and we train ourselves and discipline ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And God, we just pray that we just stay in your word. And God, also to exercise those disciplines in our life that we know help us and are profitable toward godliness. Father, we pray for your divine direction in all of it. And may you be glorified as we depend completely on you for our strength and all that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you're blessed by that. Uh, just want to tell you, uh, I love you and praying for you. I uh, look forward to the time that we regather together, all of us uh, in person. Uh, just, you know, we miss everybody. We know some people are coming right now, but we just look for the time when we'll all be together to be able to fellowship like before. And uh, we just praise the Lord that we're still able to come to you online and pray all is going well with you. And uh, just letting you know that I, as long as with all the pastors and staff, we love you. We're praying for you and believe in God for great and mighty things that are coming forward. And we just uh, pray God's richest blessings upon you. God bless you.